finishes out his final trades on the floor. Peter Schiff, the stock market is worried. You're not worried. Well, you know, I think the stock market is going down because it was in need of a correction. I don't think it's panicking uh, because of the, the debt ceiling or the Washington shutdown, although a resolution to that phony crisis may be the catalyst uh, for the uh, end of the correction, but that doesn't mean it caused it. But the real threat is the debt, not the ceiling. The main thing that stands between America and more debt is that debt ceiling, and that's why the president wants to raise it. It's because he doesn't want to actually pay any of our bills. He wants to continue to borrow money instead of paying the bills, uh, and yet he's pretending that raising the debt ceiling is the fiscally responsible thing to do when it's the most reckless thing to do. Mm -hmm. Kenny Polkari, let me, let me kick this off with you here in terms of the market reaction. Right. We heard the president talk for more than an hour. Right. Uh, the market was steady, and then 10 minutes before the close, big sell-off here. So what happened at the close, Kenny? Well, yeah, I think it's a realization that this gridlock in Washington is going to persist, and so therefore the market needs to reprice. And the, Peter did say, you know, this, the correction may have needed to happen, but it's really happening as a result of the dysfunction taking place in Washington. Not necessarily so economic, although we are entering earnings season. Any minute now, we're going to get Alcoa out, and it's going to launch earnings season. And I think what people are going to really want to pay attention to is what are these CEOs now going to say about this situation in Washington? If this persists, what's it going to mean six months down the line, three months down the line, the next quarter? And yeah. so the investors are going to start to get kind of anxious about that, which is why you see kind of the market repricing. All right. And, and, and uh, by the way, we're waiting on Alcoa earnings. As soon as those numbers come out, we'll have them for you. Then we'll talk to Clark Kleinfeld, CEO, find out what he saw in the last three-month period. But, uh, uh, Courtney Reagan, let me, let me get your take on, on where we are. Earnings expectations now down to growth of about 3%. We're still waiting on some revenue growth uh, to show us that, in fact, we are seeing some, uh, some stability here. Right. But let's not forget the government's shut down, so we don't have the economic data to actually give us a window into all of that. Exactly, and so perhaps we're going to be paying even more attention to the CEO commentary, reading between the lines of the revenue growth, hoping that there will be some, because we don't have that broader read right now, at least for a period of time, from the government about what's going on in the business community, with the lending, with consumers, how they're feeling, how they're spending, any of that. Earnings season is important, but it is somewhat shifted to the side right now because of what's going on in Washington. I think the markets tried to slip off the gridlock for a while, but now we've really had to pay attention to it, especially as this new deadline looms. It's not a deadline that just came out of nowhere. We know that it's been coming for some time, but right now it's feeling very frustrating, I think, for traders and investors to try to take the appropriate positions while they're waiting for these politicians to fight back and forth and come up with these dueling press conferences. Uh, by the way, Alcoa is out. We got 11 cents on earnings uh, versus an estimate of 5 cents a share. Wow. I'm to look at this as an actual clean number here. 11 cents X items versus uh, 5 cent estimate. Looks better than expected, certainly on the uh, bottom line. On the top line, revenue also looks better at 5.77 billion versus an estimate of 5.6. Three billion. We're going to talk with Klaus Kleinfeld, the CEO, momentarily. Let me ask you, Rick Santelli, as we saw this market sell off in the final few minutes of trading here, sitting uh, at the lows here at 160 points, what were you seeing in fixed income yield? Certainly one of the big stories on the day today. Well, the yields are the big story if you happen to be an unlucky group of short-term bills that have a cash flow issue in the period on the calendar that's going to be the most questionable period as to whether Things get paid, things don't get paid. And the four-week bill we auctioned last week is on the last day of October. Of course, add a week for the new bills we just auctioned, and that makes sense. And the yields have moved up thousands of percent based on where they were at zero, zero, three auctions ago. But if you stop thinking about that for a minute and then look at a 10-year or 30-year, this is the 11th day a 10-year is closed between a 260 and a 265 yield. So really, it's a calendar question mark, and I don't want to diminish it, because some traders are a little concerned that it could have an effect on an already fragile repo market. Mm -hmm. Mike, Santoli, uh, Mike Santoli, let's talk about that a bit for a minute here, because, you know, these markets can change in a nanosecond. We saw what happened at the end of the day today. We're down about 6% from the highs on the market. If this shutdown goes into a new week and we are approaching that debt ceiling deadline of October 17th, how much of a possibility is uh, rates skyrocketing and basically putting the markets in control, dominating sentiment with a, sh a sharp sell-off in stocks? Well, 
Well, I don't know about rates skyrocketing. As Rick said, I mean, the actual longer maturities are fine, but I do think that the stock market gets nervous whenever it sees this kind of mechanical dislocation, indigestion, the short, short end of the curve. So that is a problem. To me, the stock market's been trading almost like a stock option with nine days to maturity. So every day it loses a little bit of value because of time decay. But the actual, it's not a panic. Today you saw the beginning of the process. A lot of the areas thought to be havens that were growth darlings started to buckle a little bit today. That's the beginning of the realization that maybe you can't hide somewhere. Uh, but I don't really think there's a fat pitch that says buy it right here. You might actually have to see a little more stretching to the downside before it becomes obvious that you'd want to buy it. Kenny, real quick. Mike, I do agree with you, but I will say that as the day wore on, you could feel that the volume was starting to pick up very different than in the last couple of yeah. days, it's been kind of muted. Today, as after his speech in the last hour, you could feel that there was more pressure in the market, and then let's set up and see what happens tomorrow. But it feels like there yeah. wants you to know, be th some this is not This is not the real crisis. You're talking about rates skyrocketing. Eventually, when the Fed loses control, rates right. are going to skyrocket, right. and exactly. then default is going to be inevitable. Right, right well, now, we're just talking about it because interest rates are still so low that we can service the debt. And so we don't have to default yet. But eventually, when the markets lose confidence because we have so much debt and they know we're going to keep printing money, that's when we can't play this game anymore. Because it's right. not about the lending ceiling, the debt ceiling. It's about the lending ceiling. Because we won't be able to borrow unless the Fed prints 